This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey everyone, this is Jenny Holtzman, and I did the voice for Peppermint Patty in the 80s for the Peanuts. And you're listening to Tommy Throwback Kovac on Splat from the Past. Tommy will keep you on your toes. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now, I am just so excited for today's guest because I will be talking to Melanie Cohn. She did the voice of Lucy Van Pelt in four Charlie Brown CBS specials back in the 70s. Um, It's a Mystery Charlie Brown, The Easter Beagle Charlie Brown, uh, Be My Valentine Charlie Brown, You're a Good Sport Charlie Brown, and then finally she went out with a bang with... The theatrical film, Race for Your Life, Charlie Brown, which is my personal favorite. And they were all directed by another guest of mine, Phil Roman. And we're going to talk about all of that stuff today, and I just cannot wait. She will be at the Silver Age Comic Con in Reno, Nevada at Circus Circus, June 11th. Um, That's Dave uh, Howard's um, con. Dave's been on the show as well. It's going to be a great conversation, and I cannot wait. Uh, Part of my childhood, and it's just such a sweet memory to me. So, uh, yeah, here is my interview with Melanie Cohn. Hey, Melanie, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm great. How are you? I am just spectacular. This is uh, such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Oh, absolutely. Awesome. So, going back in time, um, your sister, Robin Cohn, had done uh, Lucy's voice for Snoopy Come Home and a few other specials. Um, So it was only natural that you were going to be the next in line. Well, should I correct you? (laughs) Go right ahead. (laughs) Uh, Actually not. So what happened was... um, well, I'll start from the beginning. Peanuts is always voiced by kids. Mm-hmm. So the kids get about two years average. Yeah. And girls' voices change just as boys do, but it's not as dramatic, of course. Mm-hmm. So um, she retired, mm-hmm. and they don't tell you when, when you retire. They just don't call you anymore. Mm-hmm. But they called the house, and they said... Um, we're actually calling about Melanie this time. We'd like her to come in and audition. So I went in and I auditioned for Sally and Lucy. And my voice was too deep for Sally and too high for Lucy. But, and this is where you are correct, Mm -hmm. they said um, because my voice quality was similar to my sister's, uh, they let me start voicing Lucy early, and that's why I got a little extra time. I see, I see. So, yeah, I wasn't too far off. <laughs> you weren't. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, uh, you're you're a Bay Area native like I am. Yes, I am. Yes, I'm uh, born and raised in San Mateo. I moved out of there five years ago, and I've been here in Reading ever since. Uh, it wasn't until uh, the Internet I found out about Charles M. Schultz coming from the Bay Area and getting uh, local kids from San Mateo and Burlingame uh, to do voices. It makes me so proud to be both a Charlie Brown fan and a Bay Area native. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, as you probably know, there there's a Charles M. Schultz Museum in Santa Rosa as well as the skating rink. Mm-hmm. And um, so he was originally from Minnesota, and he moved out to the Bay Area, and he was a huge Giants fan. And they did a recording in San Francisco at a place called Coast Recorders. Um, I -hmm. believe shortly after I voiced uh, Lucy, they moved it to San Mateo, Mm -hmm. where Lee Mendelson Productions is. And Lee Mendelson was the producer. Bill Melendez was the director. Yeah, as it's it's just so amazing. I just I feel so proud to be a Bay Area native because of the association. Yeah. Did uh, did your parents uh, g- uh, get you involved in school plays and community theater before uh, the voices? Yes, I started stage acting at three years old, and um, I mm-hmm. stage acted all the way through college. Um, 
And one of the things that I don't remember, but my mother told me was that I was in a play with Robin Williams. I was in, in um, Pinocchio. He played Geppetto, and I what? was I was something. I was very young. <laughs> Wow, that is so cool. So you, you don't remember anything about him? I don't, but I do know that we were in the same, uh, we were taught by the same woman mm -hmm. uh, a long, long time ago. And um, he was he was about, I think, maybe 13 years older than I. And so, but we were in, she, she taught community theater for years and years, and she was very uh, well known in Marin County. Wow, that is so cool. Were, were your parents actors as well? No, no, they weren't. That's, you know, nobody's ever asked me that. Um, no, my father was in advertising. He worked for the, the big agencies. Mm -hmm. And um, my mother was, um, she was a stay-at-home mom when I was growing up. So, no, they weren't. But they, had, they obviously had an appreciation for the arts, and that's why they got uh, you and your sister involved. Yeah, my dad my dad did. He, he signed us up with a casting agency in, in San Francisco. Nice. Back then, it was a little bit more smaller. Um, it wasn't uh, like it is today. Um, no, it, well, everything was different back then. Yeah. <laughs> So the first, it, it's funny because the first job that we got was, we were in The Godfather, the first Godfather movie. Oh, wow. And, yeah, and, and they happened to be filming the scene, um, well, I should say, I, I, it was probably the other way around. They were filming a scene in the town where I grew up, in Marin County, mm -hmm. and so they asked us to be in that scene, and I was actually, the take that they used, I was holding Diane Keaton's hand mm -hmm. um, and walking along with the school kids in front of the school that I went to. So it was pretty cool. Yeah, that is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, because uh, Francis Coppola, he's a San Francisco guy. Uh, do you remember anything about him? I don't. All I remember is meeting Al Pacino and, and having a crush on him, and I was probably about seven years old. <laughs> yeah, nobody knew who he was yet. No, no, not really. But he was very handsome, and I think he was in his 30s, probably early 30s. And I think that was my first crush. <laughs> oh, my God. Next time I watch that, I'm going to go, it's Melody. <laughs> <laughs> I was wearing a little a red cap and a camel hair coat, and it was about a half hour before the end of the movie. Camel hair coat. That's very controversial now. <laughs> I know. <laughs> oh, my God. That's awesome. So were you already a Charlie Brown fan uh, when you uh, first started? Um, I don't recall if I was. Well, I know that I watched because of my sister. Mm -hmm. And, of course, everybody watched the Christmas, the Christmas and Halloween specials um, were the yeah. first ones that they did in the mid 60s and then um uh, when my you know my sister was the fourth lucy and so she did the thanksgiving special right so of course we watched that absolutely yeah the, so um it was it's a mystery charlie brown was the first one you did um, well, it sounds like you've done your research, so yeah. <laughs> I've forgotten the order, but that sounds about right. Yeah. According to IMDb, in, in It's a Mystery Charlie Brown, Lucy offers legal counsel for seven cents, which is two cents more than her usual psychiatric rate. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I remember that. Yeah. Now, th this special and, and the others were directed by uh, another guest of mine, the legendary, brilliant Phil Roman, who says hi, by the way. I, um, I, I advertised I was going to be talking to you, and he saw it, and he absolutely loved it. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Hey. What, what was he like to work with? You know, I don't recall, um, I don't recall him. I, I hate to say it, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I worked with Bill Melendez. Mm -hmm. And um, so back then, 
the way that they did it, and, and I'm assuming they still do, mm-hmm. is um, they have the kids record separately. Uh-huh. So I only worked with with the uh, with Bill Melendez and, and Lee Mendelson, and I would go into the studio, and and Bill would say uh, the lines of the person that I was supposed to be talking to. Mm-hmm. And. And back then, they did uh, they hand painted every frame, so yeah. they would do the voices, and then they would they would match up the art um, with the voices, and it would it took six months to make a half hour special, which is really twenty two minutes of programming. So it was it was a long process. Yeah, she. Um, he told me, and he he brought a tear to my eye when he said this. He said, you know, uh, you know, he's not he's not a big fan of CGI or the computer animation, which I'm not either. But he said, yeah, it, it takes the magic out of a paint and brush, and that that just I thought that was so beautifully put and so profound, you know, uh, when he told me that and. I, I told him how much I loved the Cat in the Hat uh, CBS uh, special, and uh, he he told me that um, that was that that was one of his least favorite experiences. And I felt bad for loving it. I think it's an amazing uh, um, animation achievement, but he didn't have a good experience with that. Um, that's too bad. Yeah, and that happens quite often. Um, I'll, I'll mention a project that ends up being the guest's least favorite of anything they've done, and I, it almost makes me feel bad for loving it because they didn't have a good experience. But um, wh- what do you remember about 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 Lee Mendel- uh, Lee Mendelson and or Bill Melendez? Lee Mendelson was wonderful, and he mm-hmm. actually reminded me of my dad. Um, really, and they were probably about the same age, close to the same age. And he just, he, he was just so much like my dad, just a really sweet person. And he actually came and picked me up a few times, uh, drove, you know, drove all the way to Marin County and picked me up and drove me back to San Francisco to record. Oh, um, that's wonderful. Bill Melendez was, um, he was great. He, um, I don't know if you know or if the listeners know, but um, he voiced Snoopy and Woodstock. And, you know, a lot of people yeah. wonder, you know, who, who the voices were. And so he did that, I, th- I think, all the way until he passed away. Yeah. He was so, the... did you know that? I did, I did know that, yeah. He was, he's, he's the only, you, you know, non-child <laughs> voice in, in, the, in, in the entire production. Right, and that's what I should have said at the beginning, that it was all voiced by children except for him. Yeah. So now, um, yeah, so he, they were both great. Um, now the, the show that they have on Apple TV, mm-hmm. um, that's all done in Canada. It's produced in Canada. It's voiced by Canadian kids. Huh. Um, it's interesting that you say about, you know, the... The, the change in animation. Um, my kids are all in uh, the visual effects industry in, in Vancouver, and mm-hmm. my youngest actually worked for the studio that um, owns most of Peanuts worldwide. So it's a whole new world, absolutely, and I know that my kids can appreciate how things were done um, in the olden days, uh, but it's, it's really interesting how they've um, kind of combined art and computer science to to do their jobs now. Uh, that that is terrific. Yeah, I mean, when the general rule of thumb is when um, when Hollywood or California um, doesn't want to do it anymore, you go to Canada and they do a great job over there. Yeah, they do. A lot of a lot of stuff is done there in Vancouver. Oh, uh, that is so awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Todd Barbie was the first Charlie Brown you worked with, and then uh, Duncan Watson. Uh, what do you remember about those two? Well, it's funny. So Todd was actually in my sister's class, and you know that I don't know if it's still like this now, but back then mm-hmm. we we didn't associate much with people that weren't in our grade. Um, you uh-huh. know, somebody was two years older. It was like, wow, they're really old. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I do remember him, and I do keep in touch with him on Facebook. Um, Duncan, I, I, I had, must have been in the studio with him at some point because 
I ended up seeing him at church and recognizing him Mm -hmm. uh, when I was probably about 12 or 13. And then I got a hold of him on Facebook probably about six months ago, Mm -hmm. and I lured him into what I'm doing, Mm -hmm. um, going to Comic-Cons, and we actually reunited for the first time in 45 years, um, (laughs) two weeks ago, a week and a half ago. Oh, that's awesome. Like, uh, was it really emotional? Not really, because we've been talking, you know, on the phone and and on Facebook, and, you know, I, I, he's still working full time, so I got him to agree to do some cons with me, and mm-hmm. we've got, I, I believe, three or four more set up so far. So um, the first one we did was in New Jersey, and we also had um, Patricia Pat, who voiced Peppermint Patty after us. Mm-hmm. We didn't know her, but I had gotten in touch with her as well through Facebook, so mm-hmm. the three of us did our first show together, and she and I have a couple scheduled, he and I have uh, a couple scheduled, and then we have some scheduled, uh, the three of us, so oh, it's pretty cool. That is pretty cool, yeah. Did, did, um, it's Arbor Day, Charlie Brown, and, an- and Happy Anniversary, Charlie Brown, they were released in your era, but you were just unavailable for those? Um, that would have been, I would have probably had retired by then. Okay. Um, so if Duncan voiced Charlie Brown in those, um, it, it just has to do with the timing that I must have retired. And mm-hmm. he is a year older than I am, but mm-hmm. I guess he, maybe he had a, you know, his voice hadn't changed yet. Okay. Yeah. Sarah Beach uh, did the voice of Lucy in those. Uh, so what were all the kids at your school aware that you were doing the voice of Lucy or did you keep that a secret? They were aware. Um, they became aware of something going on when, uh, the, during the filming of the Godfather, because mm-hmm. the town where I grew up, there were 2000 people. So I believe the entire town or the majority of the town was at the school watching during the filming and the kids, all the kids wanted to, you know, they were like, oh, can we, can we be in the movie too? And they didn't understand the concept of the union and, you know, not being able to, to do something if you weren't in the union. And then um, they definitely were aware when I got pulled out of school to go do my recordings. So, mm-hmm. yes, they, they, def- they knew what was going on. Uh, that's where you considered the coolest uh, kid on the playground. <laughs> um, mm, not really. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, no, I was just. I mean, they knew, but they they just. I guess they just treated me like everybody else. Oh, that's cool. Um, you're a good sport, Charlie Brown is the only one that won an Emmy, uh, which, which I find hard to believe because I think the Christmas special should have won an Emmy. It, it was it was so good and so legendary. Uh, do you remember watching the Emmys that night when it won? I don't. No. I don't remember. That was a long, long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so... Mm-hmm. Did it, what, which category did it win? Oh, that's a good question. Let me look that up. It was I'm po- assuming probably the best animated special. I'm sure. Let's see here. I have to admit, I didn't even know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you just told me something I didn't know. Let's see. It won Outstanding Children's Special. Oh, wow. Interesting. And it tied with the uh, cartoon Huckleberry Finn. Oh. Yeah. Very interesting. So, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Todd Barbie voiced Charlie Brown in uh, It's the Easter Beagle, Charlie Brown. Right. Um, Duncan voiced in You're a Good Sport and um, Be My Valentine, Charlie Brown, and the movie Race for Your Life, Charlie Brown. So we were both in those. Um, and when we do, mm-hmm. well, we've got, we've only done one con together, but, um, we have some things that are, um, you know, related to those shows and that movie that we both sign. So it's kind of cool. Mm-hmm. That's cool. What, so what's your favorite of the four specials? Oh, my favorite is, um, it's the Easter Beagle, Charlie Brown. 
because mm-hmm. it was so um, lively and fun, and I loved watching Snoopy dancing with the bunnies. <laughs> and also, I liked the part of where um, Snoopy kisses Lucy because I am germphobic in real life, so oh. kind of goes with <laughs> my personality. It's it's an epidemic, you know, being a fear of germs. You know, look at Howie Mandel. <laughs> I'm not quite that bad. Um, yeah. I, you know, I, I, feel, I feel for him, definitely. I'm not that bad, though. I'm, I do shake people's hands, but then I use hand sanitizer afterwards. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Everybody's got to do that now. Yeah, my favorite is uh, You're a Good Sport, Charlie Brown. Oh. Yeah, yeah. I have heard that from, a, from other people, too. Yeah, well, I, I used I, I used to play football, so you know anything, anything you know football oriented, you know I like. Yeah. So let's let's get into Race for Your Life, Charlie Brown, because I used to watch this movie on HBO growing up. They played it constantly, and you know I wasn't allowed to go to summer camp growing up, so I've always loved that that summer camp motif, you know, uh, ma- mainly because I always longed for having that experience. So uh, this was the third Charlie Brown movie to be released theatrically, and this year is the 45th anniversary. Uh, when you found out there was going to be a, uh, another Charlie Brown theatrical movie, did you jump jump the chance to be Lucy one last time? No, they actually, I think, uh, and I could be wrong, mm-hmm. but I don't believe anything was done between uh, after 1975. Um, well, actually, that was recorded. That would have been recorded in 74, mm-hmm. but um, the specials, but uh, the, when they um, were decided they were going to do that movie, I was still, I hadn't retired yet. Mm-hmm. So they just, they called me to do the movie because um, I was still, in, in air quotes, I was still Lucy. Um, but then after that movie, that was it for me. I guess my voice changed. What Was it the same situation, or was there a little bit more pressure because it was a big, big studio like Paramount backing it? Um, in my recollection, it was just the same. I just did my lines the same. And mm-hmm. what Duncan and I figured out was that when we did that one song, She'll Be Coming Round the Mountain When She Comes, yeah. we all the kids were in the studio to sing that song. So that's how I met all the kids one time. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, they had, uh, they had, uh, boys doing, uh, girls' voices, like, uh, Stuart Brotman was Peppermint Patty. And, you know, it's funny because I, I never knew that they also used girls. I was told, uh, back then that mm-hmm. it was a boy. And... When I saw that, you know, I saw on Facebook that Patricia Patz was going to be at a Comic Con, I thought, well, that's interesting. I didn't, I had no idea that girls voiced Peppermint Patty. So I looked it up and it was, they used both. Um, you know, if, they, mm-hmm. if there was a boy that sounded the part, they, they chose a boy. And if a girl sounded good, they chose the girl. So it was just uh, a role that they, they used both. And of course, it's very common nowadays. I mean, you got you know Nancy Cartwright doing the voice of Bart Simpson, and uh, Pamela Adlon always does boy voices in cartoons. Yep, um, definitely. A lot of women are doing teenage boy or young boy voices. Definitely. Mm-hmm. And they're and they're great at it too. You know, I mean, you can't really yep. tell. You know. <laughs> Yeah, al- uh, along with uh, this and along with um, Bon Voyage, Charlie Brown, and Don't Come Back, these were like huge, you know, Paramount distribution deals. You know, they were they were on TV all the time when I was growing up. Um, yeah, because the, fir- the first two Charlie Brown movies, they were um, released by National General Pictures, which was already, you know, gone by the time these movies uh, came out. Uh, did, did you did you attend the premiere or screening of the movie? No, I didn't. I saw them on TV just like everybody else. Oh. But I will tell you that mm-hmm. I did not see anything in color until I was in my early twenties. Oh, so I you didn't have a? I you, had a black and white TV until I was in my early twenties. 
I, I got to have a, a, a little teeny tiny black and white TV when I was little. And I, I, it's, it's so funny when I think about it now because it was like 1988, 89 when I had that. And then there was no more black and white TVs after that. Yeah, it was, it was probably the mid-80s when I had my first color TV. Yeah. You, so. Mm-hmm. You probably I, hit. Yeah, I, I watched them for the first time in color. It was interesting. You, you never at least saw a, a, a colored uh, TV at a friend's house or anything? Oh, sure I did, but I don't, I don't recall. Well, the specials were always on at night, so I was always home. Mm-hmm. And I, I just remember seeing everything was in black and white, and it was just kind of taken for granted that that's how it was. Mm-hmm. So by the time um, Bon Voyage Charlie Brown was being uh, made, your voice probably changed, and that was it for you. Yeah, and and of course, you know, we don't notice. I mean, maybe some girls do. I'll, I'll speak for myself. I didn't notice that my voice changed, but mm-hmm. um, and I didn't know that girls voice, you know, I didn't realize until then, you know, when I was told um, that girls' voices do change, not real dramatically, but they do get deeper as a girl goes into um, adolescence. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they don't, they, 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 yeah, they, I mean, it's, I think some people realize their voice is changing and others don't, you know, and yeah. sometimes it's just uh, the timber of their voice that's changed, but not the overall voice, you know. Right. So, yep. so what did you do after that? Um, well, I did, I didn't do much. I mean, I did a couple of auditions. There was a, there was something that didn't come to fruition. It was, uh, there was going to be a, a show on TV and, mm-hmm. um, they were, and I, I auditioned for it and I got the part, but then they, it, it got X after, before they even did the pilot. So that, that didn't happen. Um. I just, I continued with stage acting and, um, and then I went on and, uh, worked just like a regular person and raised a family, raised kids. And then I got into radio. Um, I, I was on air for a while and I, I also sold advertising and, um, I wrote most of my clients ads and voiced whenever it called for a female voice, I asked them if they wanted me to, and to voice the female part, and most of them did, so I got a lot of uh, opportunity to, to record. So, so you never yeah. really, you never really left it. You know, you just um, you explored it in other areas. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. That's cool. Are, are you amazed at how much of an impact the Peanuts Gang franchise has had over sixty years later? Absolutely. I had no idea until I started um, traveling around. I, I do comic cons and I comic book stores and I I uh, bookstores. I did a fast food place here in Texas that was um, had a peanuts theme uh, around football season. Um, I I have people come up to me and tell me that they grew up with me. I mean, this is something I hear so many times. People say, I grew up with you. You were part of my childhood. And I just, I do, I do think it's amazing that Mm -hmm. people, I talk to people in three different generations. I had three different generations stand in front of me. The grandparents, the parents, the children, like teenage children that are all into it, that, you know, have loved it. The grandparents have loved it, you know, since they were small. Um, and yeah, it is amazing to me and it's amazing to me how many super fans there are that come up to me wearing, you know, peanuts garb from head to toe. Yeah. (laughs) It's, it's crazy. And I even had somebody come up to me, uh, cause he was cosplaying Linus. So he came up with, with the red and blue striped shirt and the, the blanket. And he had a couple of, um, he had like a Charlie Brown and a Lucy, plushie that he was carrying around with him. 
Yeah, that, that's that's cool. Yeah, I, I forgot to mention you're my second Lucy I've interviewed. I I, I talked to Angela Sloan who played who played Lucy in the '80s. Her and um, Stacy Tolkien, who was Sally, they they both came on together, and we just had a blast. We were laughing and just having a, a great time. Oh, that's awesome. So from their era, Brad mm-hmm. Keston was the Charlie Brown, and right. we're actually doing a show in Lubbock, Texas in July. Yeah. Um, I'll meet him for the first time in person. He's, so, a, he's a great guy. I've talked to him, too. Yeah. Yeah. I also uh, talked to Jeannie Holtzman, who's Peppermint Patty in the 80s, too. Yeah. They're, they're, they're all great people, and... They uh, they revel in the in in their uh, their peanuts gang you know um, legacy. <laughs> well, that's great. I mean, they they were you know they were in a, a TV show, so they got to do a lot more than than the people that were just did the specials. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, it's interesting because I think that they've kind of carried it with them. Um, and done, you know, been interviewed a lot, and they do the Hollywood show every year in Burbank. Yep. And, you know, I lived my life up until last March. I lived my life pretty much not telling anybody and not really um, making a deal about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I made my kids watch the shows, yeah. and I would say, that's mommy, that's mommy's voice. And then when they got older, they started doing the wah, 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 wah to me. So, <laughs> you know, I had it, you know, I had it in the household, but I never really talked about it much outside, outside the house. It wasn't until you started getting invited to the cons? Well, it started out with somebody getting a hold of me um, and asking if he could buy 50 of my signatures. And I said, <laughs> oh, well, sure. And then he said that he could refer me, he was just going to refer me to somebody that, that could get me into shows. And the gentleman got me into one show mm-hmm. um, local, locally, and, and then that was it. I didn't hear back from him, and I thought, well, you know, let me, let me see what I can do on my own. Because I, had, I wasn't working at the time, it was during COVID. Mm-hmm. And so I just started prospecting the same way I prospected when I worked in radio. I just started reaching out to all these different places, and next thing I knew, I had pretty much uh, filled up. Well, I pretty much got this year filled up. So mm-hmm. I, I didn't. I had no idea how it would go, and and then I realized that there are a lot of Peanuts fans out there. And is that your sister doing the cons too? No, she's not. Um, as far as I know, she did. She did San Diego. Um, I believe it was 2008. They had a bunch of peanut voices, and mm-hmm. uh, nobody had gotten a hold of me. So I, I had no idea that was going on. I had, I had no idea. I, I think I'd heard of the San Diego uh, because of my kids, but um, I didn't, I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know anything about doing cons. Um, just mm-hmm. kind of fell into it last year. A lot of people are, are falling into it. So many people I've interviewed, uh, you know, they, they were just living their lives like you were, and then suddenly people started reaching out to them, you know, and, um, you know, they're, they're enjoying it so far. You know, I've met people who were in the con scene for years, and then the, they, they, um, they got out of it for various reasons, you know. And a lot of people do the cons in between their work. You know, because a lot of people are still active. Mm-hmm. A lot of the actors, um, you know, movie actors, TV actors. Um, but it's, for me, it's it's definitely, I've made it a full-time job for mm-hmm. myself. Um, between uh, organizing, buying merchandise, getting everything ready, depending on what I'm doing, like, this weekend, I'm going to South Dakota, mm-hmm. and it's going to be a longer trip because they're going to take me to Mount Rushmore, which I'm really, really excited about. Um, so, you know, I, I have to decide what I'm going to bring with me, if I'm going to check a bag, which I usually do if I'm going out of town, um, if I'm flying somewhere. Mm-hmm. And then I come back, and I have to recover, and then yeah. start getting preparing for the following weekend. So... And I do a lot of local stuff because Texas is so big. So I go to Dallas, San Antonio, um, the Houston area. 
Galveston. So I, I go all over the place in Texas, but some places are so far away, like Lubbock, I have to fly because it's on the other side of Texas. Yeah, a lot of teachers, um, they have to do uh, the, the conventions in the summertime for obvious reasons. Yeah. You know. What um, What do you make of uh, PBS buying the holiday specials after NBC uh, didn't want to play them anymore? Um, well, it was actually Apple that bought, bought them. And I, I know, I, I knew something was going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't know exactly what, but I knew something was going to happen because I was told. Um, and I think that it's, you know, people ask me that all the time. And I, um, the only thing I can say is it's, it's part of business. It just, it mm-hmm. happens. It's, you know, things are on a contract for X number of years. And then the contract's either renewed or something happens. There's a sale. Mm-hmm. So... I think that in today's with today's technology, mm-hmm. um, having them on DVD, yeah. and, you know, being able to buy them for ten dollars or you know whatever it is, yeah. um, makes it a lot easier. Uh, they can be streamed. Of course, it costs. You know, you have to pay for Apple TV, but um, it, there are other options now. Is it sad that they're not on TV anymore? Yeah, it, it is sad. But I do understand business, and, and I understand that things change. I, I like the fact that they're on PBS, though. I, 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 li- I like PBS, and I like what they do. You know, some people criticize them, but I, I was glad that at least they picked it up, you know, because um, it's just, it, it was, it was kind of sad, you know, because it was, always, it was always there on NBC. You could just turn it on, and it was right there, you know. Um, I, I know that uh, How the Grinch Stole Christmas is, is still under contract at NBC. I remember for years it was at, it was at TNT and TBS, and, of course, uh, um, after that, then it went, it went back to NBC. So, yeah, the contracts, they're, they're pretty interesting, I have to say. Yeah, and, and from what I understand, PBS picked them up just because so many people were upset about it, and, you know, understandably, and... And like I, like I said, it's it's just part of business. It things evolve, things change, and you know it was, you know, it is sad, but mm. happened. So there are other options. It's not like it went away. It, that's the way no. I look at it. It's not like it went away for good. No, it's just out of the comfort zone. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's a good way to put it. Definitely. So June 11th, you'll be at uh, Silver Age Comic Con at Circus Circus in Reno, Nevada. I know uh, Dave and Marina, they're great people, and they, they have all these different cons going on and stuff. Dave's, yeah. been, Dave's been on the podcast. And, oh, um, great. Yeah, and um, that, that should be a lot of fun. You looking forward to that one? I am. I'm looking forward to meeting Dave, too, because I follow all, his, his, all the different cons that he's doing, and... Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, it, actually, that was the first contract I signed. Mm-hmm. Um, I arranged this with Dave months and months ago. I want to say it was last summer sometime. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I, it, he sent me the contract, and I looked at it, and I was like, oh, th- this is interesting. You know, I read through it, and I'm like, oh, wow, you know, this is... It, you know, he basically, so normally what happens is when I get a hold of a promoter, mm. um, they ask what my requirements are. But I think he probably knew that I was brand new at, at doing cons, so he sent me the contract and I agreed to everything. And, and it, it it's very fair. It's absolutely fair because it's pretty much what I would ask for now. Um, you know, because mm. that's just... I have my mindset requirements, and he basically sent, sent me the contract and said, this is what I'm offering you. And um, so, yeah, this has been arranged for quite a long time, and, yes, I'm bear- I'm looking forward to it very much. That is so awesome. That Yeah. I was supposed to uh, uh, host a panel for him uh, last September, but my mother was having surgery that week, so I had to drop out at the last minute, unfortunately. But... Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I I go to at least one of their cons every year and stuff, and they're always a great time. You know, they're 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 you know they're they're based on you know um, you know entertaining the fans. You know, and they want they want to work with good people. You know, who are not too much of of divas. You know, and that are going to be very fan friendly. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I hear about those divas. I'm definitely not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I know that I I will always be humble, and I can say definitely say the same about Duncan. I mean, he's I can tell that he will always be humble. He he just he keeps telling you this is surreal. I I just can't believe this, you know. And I I've been helping him, and he actually is having me do all of his bookings and you know help him with his merchandise and everything because I have so much more experience than he does. You know, like about mm-hmm. six months. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I learn something new every day, and I, I love passing on the the information that I that I have and what I've learned. So it's it's really fun. Oh, that is beautiful. You're such a good friend too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a, a lifetime friend that that we just didn't talk for forty five years. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope I get to meet you in person someday, and I hope you have a, you know, uh, a wonderful summer, and that uh, you have fun at these cons, and and it's it's so amazing that um, the story, this this story, and this journey, and this path you've been on is 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 keeping you going, Melanie. It really is. Yeah, I'm I'm really grateful. I really am. Well, you have yourself a great day, and please stay safe. You as well. Thank you so much for having me on. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Melanie Cohn. Ain't she a sweetheart? Oh, what a great lady, huh? And she's just, you know, plugging away there as Lucy Van Pelt and helping Duncan Watson in the convention scene. What a, what a great person, huh? I, I'm so happy I got to talk to her today. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the, because the present sucks. Later, dudes!